Hey, good afternoon everybody. John Jerkowitz here and welcome to my bi-monthly, bi-weekly, bi-monthly, be every two months, bi-weekly hangout. We got a great panel, we got a great topic, and I'm quite sure for those of you out there watching, whether you're watching us here at Google+, Plus, whether you're watching us on YouTube, or you're watching us live from my webpage, I'm sure you're a wonderful group of people. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about fear. I know in this positive world we live in, we, we don't like to talk about it. I, uh, I have a friend that's fond of saying we'd rather go stand up on the hill, put our arms around one another and sing We Are the World and kind of forget about some of the things that got us to where we are today. So what I did is I asked four very successful people to join us and to talk about their journey and to talk about what are you more afraid of? Are you more afraid of failure or are you more afraid of success? And so I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves and I'm going to start, oh I'm going to go ahead and say it. My sister from another mister, Ms. Carrie Roldan. Carrie? Hi John. Uh it's true. I think we are um, at least somehow cosmically connected, right? <laughs> um, but I am Carrie Roldan. I host a weekly hangout on air called The Carrie Roldan Show. And this is how I introduce myself on the show. So it's probably best for your people, too. I say I'm a wife, a mother, a runner, a best selling author, a personal growth junkie, and your total business BFF. I help busy mompreneurs find their niche create an offer that serves them, and market it in a way that resonates but still feels totally authentic. And I'm totally stoked to be here. Crickets? Silence? No, my mouse not moving quick enough to get up to admit <laughs> myself. But see, this is live TV, okay? You have to remember that. For those of us who grew up or vaguely remember live TV, anything can happen. As someone once told me, if you want to have a professional performance, then you can go out and pay $10,000 a week to have people come in and do it. But all of a sudden, your mouse cursor freezes and you're going, oh my goodness, only that's not what you're thinking. Okay, Catherine? Hi all, and I apologize for the, the noise in the background. That's my laptop fan about which I've been able to do buckets. So um, just bear with me. I'll stay muted most of the time. Anyway, I'm Catherine Simblem, Simblem Services Online. I'm a business evangelist. I do content marketing and I'm beginning to branch out now into radio PR. So if you would like to be on somebody's podcast or HOA or a radio show, uh, keep me in mind, and uh, yeah, with that, I will mute again, so I'm not annoying everybody. Thank you, Catherine. I decided I was just going to mute my mic that's standing on the desk right now instead of trying to fool with my thing. Hey, I got to tell you, though, you know, give you just a little bit of a shout-out, because I saw Carrie doing this <laughs> when she was talking about radios and podcasts. I think I'm doing my fourth podcast she's booked me on later this week, okay? And they are a lot of fun. I, I'm, I'm telling you, they're a lot of fun. And Catherine's got a background in radio and a background in media. So, you know, those of you folks out there in listener land and those of you on the panel, if you really... Um, if you're really interested in exploiting, and I mean that in a positive way, not an inappropriate way, um, exploiting your uh, that part of your business, um, she's a person to talk to. And next is my new buddy, okay, Karen Chin. And and Karen and I actually met when. Um, I was the guest host on Lights, Camera, HOA, and they said, you know what, we want you to show our viewing audience um, how to interview somebody. And Karen was sitting out there, you know, waiting for the Hangout to start, and all of a sudden, Karen got pulled into the Hangout as a panelist, and uh, Rain Dowell said, Karen, John's going to interview you. And that's really how we met. So, um, Karen, go ahead and introduce yourself. 
Yeah, I think um, just overall the topic, John and 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 Carrie and and Mons and and Catherine, fear. It, to me, I guess I don't have any now because after meeting John literally 10 minutes before in a green room and saying, hey, you're going to be a guest and he's going to interview you and you've got 30 minutes to talk and go for it was one of the interesting things I, I never thought I would be doing. Um, and I, as I told uh, uh, Rain Donald afterwards, I, I'm ready to be, I guess, crisis management. Um, I could be the president of the United States. I could be just about anybody because the ability to just be on cue and just answer questions um, was a, a challenge onto itself. So that's how we met John, and <laughs> I think that's been a kind of interesting ride, right? Um, it's only been what two weeks now, literally. I think two uh -huh. weeks ago. Yeah, that's how that's how fast you could be on a show. I guess just because of that. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm I'm actually out here in California. I live out here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm a marketing consultant. I have just uh, been kind of introduced to social media and getting my feet in, I guess my toes dipped into the water as they say. I have uh, basically been here on the platform as a newbie on Google Plus for about 16 weeks now. So I've learned uh, quite a bit. I'm also um, a member of um, Plus your business, if you know what that is. It's, it's run by Martin Sherbington. It's it's everything you need to ever know about Google Plus. And that I'm actually, uh, for disclosure, I am actually a student there. I'm at, at level three, and I am right now in the midst of a challenge um, called the 28 Days of Love that John is participating in, and we can talk about that as part of, uh, I guess, the success or failure in terms of how you see it um, in, in accomplishing your goals. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I, I've got to tell you, if you have an opportunity to get to know Karen, please do so. I'm just going to tell you a little short story. Well, those of you that know me know there's no little short story, but I'll do what I can. Karen and I were supposed to have a five-minute discussion last Tuesday that turned into an hour and five minutes. I learned more. I was like, I gotta write this down. I gotta write this down. No, I gotta write this down. If you get an opportunity to pick this person's brain, please do so. Okay? She gave me some tips that, um, well, I'm not gonna steal her thunder, but I, I, I mean, really good, solid social media, Google Plus stuff. And finally, last but not least. Oh, since I called Carrie my sister of another mister, I guess my brother of another mother. I'm going all Mia Voss on you here today. Okay, my good friend, let's see if we can get this right. Manolis Finn Arlocas. Close, right? You were extremely close, John. Uh, you know, the way that I explained my last name, you know, it's pronounced Finn Arlocas, so not to be confused with Boom Shakalakas. Well, that's a way you can you can remember it. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for having me on your show. Uh, my name is Manolis Spinarolakis. I'm the founder and producer of Reality Crowd TV. Uh, that has been traditionally a weekly show that we've had on Google Hangouts. And what my specialty is, is we really help people who are interested in crowdfunding, whether you're an entrepreneur that's looking to raise capital through the online method of fundraising, or an investor who is looking into the newfound uh, equity and debt-based crowdfunding. And really the mission of my company and my mission is to inform, educate, inspire, and motivate entrepreneurs worldwide to start small businesses through crowdfunding and to provide them a blueprint on how to crowdfund. So uh, in a nutshell, that's, that's how I operate. And I'm really grateful to be with uh, the three or four guests we have on the show. And, and thanks, John, as always. Oh, you're quite welcome. I will tell you this. When I first self-published my book in, in September, Manolis had me on one of his crowdfunding shows on a Saturday morning. And I thought, oh, this is going to be real easy. Well, for those of you who are students of history, the Inquisition would have been a whole lot easier. I walked away from that hour and a half ordeal wondering, oh my gosh, if you really want an insight, and, and, and I am a crowdfunding disciple. I will, I will tell you that. I believe it is the wave of the future for mompreneurs, solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, any preneur you want, and small business people. 
but you better have your stuff together because I thought I did, and I walked away, no kidding, with half a legal pad full of notes that his panel just gave me advice to do prior to doing that. So um, thank you, thank you. All right, get ready to unmute yourselves. I'm going to start the discussion here. I, I will tell you my greatest fear in getting this hangout together, no kidding, I do this all the time. None of the real stuff bothers me. I enjoy being in front of the camera. I was really had a hard time worrying about pronouncing Manolis's last name. <laughs> that was my largest fear. So here's my first question. What are we more afraid of, success or failure? Go. I, um, I, I can kind of chime in on that a little bit. Um, I think it, it. I think it depends. Some people gravitate uh, toward, you know, pleasurable experiences. So when when they think of failure, they they immediately get paralyzed. You know, like I, you know, j just like Carrie, I, I myself am a personal growth junkie, and one of the people that I've uh, I've looked up to has been Anthony Robbins. I've only read his books. I've never gone to any of his live events. But he always says that we do things in life to either uh, gain pleasure or avoid pain. And so for me personally, I think I, you know, historically I've both feared failure and feared success. So I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I think at different times in your life, both of those fears can kind of come into fruition. You know, you'll, you'll feel failure when you don't have when you have a month left of uh, salary in a bank account if you're starting a small business, you'll really feel failure at that point. You know, but you might feel success when your, your business is doing great and you're about to, and you need to take it to the next level and you might need to change your associations, you might need to change your friends, you might need to do things that people might not initially understand. So the fear of success comes into the picture when you might, you know, have pain with, with losing some relationships that you've traditionally had. So for me, actually, you, you don't ever completely lose those fears of failure or success, and I think they come about at different stages of, of a business or a growth, a personal growth path. Um, it's more so how you frame those challenges that ultimately will get you to see it differently so that you can take the actions necessary to overcome them. And that's kind of my thought on that. You got six or seven good points there. Who wants to weigh in next? Well, so I already unmuted myself, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Manolas. I mean, you kind of stole my answer because I was, I was, I've been asking myself that question, right? In preparing for this hangout, what am I more afraid of? Am I more afraid of failure, or am I more afraid of success? And um, I think that I'm equally afraid of both. Oh, are we still live? By the way, can you still hear me? Okay, I just, John seems to have disappeared, but um, I'll just keep talking. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's back, but he's muted. John, we can't hear you. So. Yeah. All I did was stop my camera so I could dig something out of my desk. Okay. Oh, see, and I, <laughs> I panicked. I panicked live on air. Um, <laughs> so, but, yeah, I'm equally afraid of both. I think it depends on, just like Manolis was saying, where – where I am in my business or what is about to happen and for a long time I was really afraid of failure and I thought I had you know worked my way all the way through that only to find out oh crap now I'm kind of afraid of success and I don't know if this is going to lead us down a different path but I think for me it's just my biggest issue is the fear of fear <laughs> If that makes any sense at all. Um, so I'm going to stop there and see what anybody else has to say. I, you know, I think uh, Carrie and Melinda, the, the idea of failure to me, I think it, it's a frame of mind that you go back and forth with success or failure. You know, you have too much success, can, can you keep up with it? You know, can you keep up with um, performing? Can you keep up with your business? Can you keep up? even with your social, your personal life. I mean, I think that's what, uh, one of the issues about success or, or failure is that if you're too successful, then you might lose out on the personal because 
especially when it's business because you're just always devoted to the business side of it and then you, you miss out on you know your child's soccer game or or your your mother's birthday or just something like that and then you feel really guilty and, and just horrible about that so I think the idea of success and failure at least for me personally and I'm what I'm going through it myself when I look at it is just that you have to kind of think about what's important in your life at that moment and that the fear the fear in itself is always the fear that you're going to have and that you have to kind of blow your mind from that idea that you're, you know, failure in a way actually is a good thing when you think about it because you learn from it and you, and you experience from that aspect of it. And I think the idea of fear or challenges, that's kind of what I, I, I like to talk about is that Fear is opportunity. Success is opportunity. It's, you just have to kind of frame it in that in, in that sense, I think, in your mind, and that then you can it can help you move forward. I think to me that's what what success and failure kind of go as you say hand in hand. It's opportunities when you think about it. Thank you, Karen. Catherine, do you want to share with us? Oh, if, if I have to. <laughs> um, okay. Again, ignore uh, ignore the background noise here. Um, I think I definitely fall on the fear of success and of the spectrum. Um, I've always, even as a performer, you know, I have this front that I show the world, you know, this kind of high-performing mask, you know, I'm, uh, you know, this good, uh, good student, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. But secretly behind that is a real fear of being seen. I don't, you know, I'm, all, all appearances to the contrary, I'm actually a raving introvert. And um, uh, there's a really big streak of me that, that does not want to be acknowledged. I don't want to be famous. I do not want to be seen. Don't even look me in the eyes. I, I don't even, you know. <laughs> so I just want to hide and be a hermit in the cave. Um, and and uh, so that's... For me, in my psyche, that's that's a really big thing. Failing, uh, I can fail from now until, you know, doomsday. In fact, I've even thought about opening a school and a PhD program in failure and just like you know teaching other people how to do it because I'm so darn good at it. Uh, so uh, I d tend to be on that extreme of the, uh, the spectrum. Yeah. Anyway. But yeah, but Catherine, do you feel that you know failure in itself? It's kind of like it's your own worst enemy in the sense that you're just you beat your, you know, you beat yourself up more than anybody else. I mean, no one else sees the failure except with, except you. And you nitpick, and you, you know, you overanalyze. You say, I could tweak this, I could make this better. But in actuality, it's probably one of the best things you probably have ever done. But yet, you feel, oh, I don't like this, I don't like that. You just get to the, the nitpicky part of it. You're just finding out all the, all the flaws, and and that's what you kind of focus on when you actuality you should focus on the, the larger aspect of, um. You know, the of of a of a project, for example. That's that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, yeah, I, I come from a classical music background, and, and when you're talking about that much uh, precision, that much control, then yeah, you do end up focusing on and nitpicking at the little stuff because you've got to. You know, you've got this. You know, this standard, this incredibly high standard, and there's a, a big streak of perfectionism in there too, as well. You know, e even falling this much short of absolutely perfect is absolutely not acceptable. And, you know, the reality is nobody else on the planet even gives a rip. I mean, you know, they're just hearing the music and they're like, oh, my God, that's amazing, you know. But, uh, yeah, yeah, so that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, because I find that perfection in itself, you know, how you ever define perfection, you know, each, are, each, of us, each of us has our own definition of perfection, but I think perfection is what actually hampers the creativity because you're so focused on being so perfect, and that that's what to me means, you, you just don't see the beauty, you know, you don't see the expansion of what you could be learning from, from that because you're just so focused on this, but Perfection actually grows because you know as you get better and better at something, you know the the piece or the project gets better and better, right? But you're just so focused on that. And Karen, you you make a really good point there um, on on the perfection piece. It could be a blessing and a curse because per perfection can can stop you from actually doing something because if it's not perfect, you won't do it at all. Or it, it might have an opposite effect where you, nothing's ever good enough. 
and and so that the fear of nothing ever being good enough too is another fear where where you you start to ask yourself like you know but back to what you initially said Karen why do I do what I do what what do I find important in my life who do I want to be around um, where do I want to be in the future so like so that that piece of it I think even before anyone can start a business and and I'm 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 making it be kind of a business oriented discussion here just because this is this is your um, start small start now show but like even before the business can be created there's so much work that an individual needs to do to identify that very question because in order for a business to be successful at least from my point of view is that you really need to identify with it and really be an extension of it I mean you, you want to have a healthy balance but my opinion is there really is not much balance when when you're in business so like you have to really be okay with with uh, with the fear of um, being out of balance because if you're trying to have balance uh, and you're just starting out and that's the only revenue you have is just this business then you have to be out of balance to get a business off the ground so I just want to kind of put that in there too because a lot of people don't realize that if you're gonna start a business it has to take priority over over almost everything in your life at least in the early stages is what is what I believe good point uh, ab absolutely good point and, and you know I think for those of you out there in the audience these are folks who have been there done that sort of thing and um, I'm gonna throw a hypothesis out there for you um, and and tell me what your thoughts are on it and I kind of wrote it down as all of you were talking does success exist does failure exist or are they just kind of offshoots of our growth in our lives or in our business are, are they really just just growth opportunities okay I have to I have to comment on this one because um, I've written all these notes down of stuff we've talked about and I think you just ask the question that helps pull it together but do because I just had a friend who um, went through um, an online product launch and you know ha had all of the the things that can go right and wrong with it and was sending us a memo of her learning opportunities and she said you know it at the end of the day it was a it was an AFGO I'm like what's an AFGO and it was another effing growth opportunity <laughs> so I really like that I love that for entrepreneurs right like it's it's an AFGO like <laughs> we don't always like those growth opportunities um, but that's what they are but so here's what we talked about that it just really like got my juices flowing that I think will answer your question about success is um, Karen talked about the idea of success and the there's right too much or not enough you know like if we're if we are successful if we the fear of success is that we're gonna get too busy right that we're gonna have too many clients we're not gonna have time for the other things in our life um, and I think that's a story that we tell ourselves but that's not what success looks like that's not what success really is that's what the fear of success tells us if that makes sense and the Manolis talked about um, Oh, so what that I think well that's a different one so I'll go back but Manolas talked about balance and I think balance there's no such thing there is no such thing as balance we are always in the act of balancing <laughs> right like we're if nothing is perfectly balanced it's always balancing it's always like you know think of yourself in tree pose in yoga like it's not like you're sitting there doing nothing your little muscles are firing away like crazy to, to keep you balanced um, and I think that's what happens in our life and in our businesses like we're in an act of balancing and 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 choosing what's important and choosing our priorities and um, but the last thing is we're talking about success right and what is that and I just had a conversation on a preschool field trip of all places um, about the idea of success and I think so many of us are taught that achievement is success right like that's what we grow up just achieve 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 if you have all these accomplishing accomplishments to your name you will be successful but I know what I'm finding in my own business is you know achievements will drive you 
freaking insane. I, I can. That's where the perfectionism comes in, right? Like I can, and comparing yourself to other people's achievements, like holy crap, I could go a miyavasism, that shit crazy, <laughs> trying to achieve myself to success. Um, but that's not. I don't know what your guys' definition of success is, but mine is a life where my business doesn't run my life, but that I live my priorities. To me, that's a successful life. If I'm living my priorities, I'm successful. I'll stop. What say the rest of you? Carrie, um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll jump in on that because, Carrie, you're absolutely right. Um, John, your question of the hypothesis, does success or failure exist? I think it depends on what your metric is. Are you looking to seek external validation of your success? Because if you, if you seek external validation, then the society that we live in has very specific things that the mainstream media puts out as success or failure metrics. But, uh, but I think there's a revolution happening where people are not seeking external validation um, as much anymore. They're, they're, they're not going out to buy the big, the big house, the big car. The millennial generation has stopped spending. Their definition of success is changing rapidly, and hence the, the corporations out there have to identify with the new metric of success. So I personally would love to see a world where everyone is looking within um, to really identify that metric of success with, with their feelings. If, like, what, what we don't do enough... And, and I hadn't started doing this until five years ago, was looking at the things that I did and asking myself the question, am I doing this for me or am I doing this because it's expected of me? Or am, am I feeling good as I do this or am I feeling resentment or guilt or whatever the other thing may be? And I'm not saying that every obligation will always be pleasant. You know, you're not, you're, life isn't always pleasant. You have to do things. But I think the majority of the time, there's things that we do that we are just not aware of. We don't even understand why we're doing it. We're not feeling good as we do it, yet we continue to do it. So, so I think your question is, is within the eye of the beholder. What, you know, the, the question lies on what does that individual value do they want the external validation, or are they really looking and trying to understand what makes them happy? And then from there, that is that is where you really operate on a level which is just completely pure. Once once you're once you're acting in a business where you feel good every day that you're acting in it, even during the unpleasant parts, you've essentially identified what your measure of success is because you're only doing the things that make you feel good, and that then makes you get clients who make you feel good and you don't waste your time on people who would be time wasters. So there's like this whole other level that if you are very clear about that internal dialogue as to what is it that makes you happy, you can then build a business where it doesn't feel like work. And uh, we're diving deep here today, folks. So if you don't have your scuba gear, get it on. That was really good. All right. Can, can, uh, can I just say something really quickly? Um, I what <laughs> you guess? Oh, shut up, John. <laughs> um, that just tagging on to what Manolis was saying. Uh, something that's been up for me lately is realizing that most of my life, and maybe you know, maybe this is more true of women or not. I don't want to turn this into a a gender thing. <laughs> oh my God, don't go there. But um, something that's been up for me lately is realizing that, you know, over the, since I was a little kid, you know, people have told me, hey, you're good at this, you should develop this skill. Hey, you're good at this, you know, you're good at music, you should develop this skill. You should develop this skill. You should develop this skill. And and I've done that, you know, I spent 40 years developing my skills as a musician. But none of that was done for me. And what I'm realizing now is that it needs to be Success is more is it needs to be less about developing yourself in the ways that other people expect you to develop yourself, and more about bringing those developing skills that feed what's here. So bringing the skills back here, not 
not developing them because people say, oh, you're good at this. You know, because we're all good at a lot of things, right? Um, so we need to, you know, to a great topic, Manolis, thank you. So listening to our, our innermost selves and bringing, bringing our efforts into alignment with our, our inner beings, with our inner core, like that. Um, I have no idea if that made any sense, but anyway, I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, actually, Catherine, just to kind of add to that, I think when you think about it, you get to a certain point with age, right? You know, in your teens, you know, you, you don't want to be told what to do. In your 20s, you think you know it all. Well, actually, your teens and your 20s, you think you know it all. And then when you get to your 30s, you're like, okay, I don't think I know it all, but I'm, I'm ready to explore. And then I think as you get older and older, you get to a point, I think, when you get towards the end of your life, you know, I don't give a F anymore, and I'm just going to do whatever I'm going to do, and so be it. I'm going to wear what I'm going to wear. I'm going to drive what I'm going to drive. I'm going to live whatever I'm going to live. I'm going to eat whatever I want to eat, and I think it goes back to what I've learned, actually, in the past 16 weeks here being on Google Plus is the idea here with this platform and the, and the exchange of ideas that we're having right now using this technology of, you know, Hangouts on Air, and that you're just meeting people all over the world who um, some some you may have interest with, some may you not have interest in, and then you kind of glom on to people that have similar interests and that kind of brings you up and going back to that success versus failure. You're trying new things. I think like all of us, like what we were doing in the green room today, sharing just even how to kind of, you know, handle this HOA technology. You know, showing show, you know, Carrie Carrie was showing us how to, you know, make our backgrounds um, fuzzy and you know, um, John was was showing his tips on on you know other things I think with Comment Tracker and kind of we were just I think we were just trying to figure out even how to use Comment Tracker and I guess what I'm trying to get at is that success or failure kind of grows with you every day and that you take every day as a challenge no matter how big or how small that challenge is whether it's in your business or in your pro in your personal life you can learn from that and you can grow from that and I think that's how you kind of build on those experiences and, and as I keep saying it's either the good it's good and bad that you get you get you gain from that so I think you know Catherine as you're just as you were just going on talking I, I that's kind of what came up into my head at this moment. I, I think I'm sounding like I'm babbling, but I just I just want to just kind of bring to that point of how important it is that we kind of, as a community, support each other and help each other. And yeah. I, I think that's and that's having to have that 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 base of of trust. I think you grow from from you know either in your in your private in your business outside of social media out of you know Google Plus you got that core that you you work with and then the people that you find here on Google Plus that you want to you know work with yeah I love you people um I I'm writing and I have 15 more hangouts here okay I'm all the it, this is this is really good content you know Karen the, the point you made about business I have seen people come on to Google Plus and I've been here about 18 months and I've seen people come here with the sole intent of doing business that's their mm -hmm. sole intent not building a relationship not getting to know folks I'm gonna come in here I'm gonna market a product or a service I'm mm -hmm. gonna just wring it out like a dish towel and they're not here real long because people see it for what it is mm -hmm. now don't get me wrong I think it's an exceptional opportunity if you want to help grow your business but if you come in with a single focus and that's the only focus you come in with after a while people are going to see that and I guess that kind of leads to the next thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is authenticity and transparency mm -hmm. how much does that really play a factor in your success or failure Oh, oh, please pick me. Pick me. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay, <laughs> sis. <laughs> okay, um, I can't help but go back to Catherine um, because she said, talking about people keep encouraging her to do things that she's good at, right? And this will lead to authenticity, I promise. But if you you're good at a lot of things. But I think to have a successful business and to have a successful life means that you are doing things that are in alignment 
with the call of your soul, right? That you're so that takes you back to um, it's on Oprah on this Marcus Buckingham. Buckingham, I don't know. He was on talking about strengths and weaknesses, and he said your strengths um, aren't necessarily things that you're great at. Your strengths are things that make you feel most fully alive. The strengths, right? For, so for me, that means if you are living in your strengths, you're living in alignment with your call of your soul. And your weaknesses, you could be really great at your weaknesses. You could do them exceptionally, especially if you're like an achiever and a perfectionist, and I'm totally pointing the finger at myself. Um, but a weakness depletes you. A weakness, no matter how great you are at it, makes you do this when you think about like getting it like, yeah, I can do it. Oh God, I don't want to do it. And I think so many of us in our business volunteer to live in our weaknesses because we feel competent in them. We feel competent in our weaknesses. And so we we say, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll, you know, because it feels safe, right? And the success component, the thing that we may be most afraid of is living in our strength is living in our call of living in the call of our soul is living in our authenticity but until we do that <laughs> we're not gonna find the success that we're looking for and for me so this is gonna bring in Google Plus too for me I came to Google Plus um, with because I had just gone through what I saw as a massive failure in my business and I just was so tired of like trying to get rich quick. <laughs> I was so tired of tired of trying to like take the speeding bullet to success and get that next program and follow these next steps and find my people. And I just sort of said, oh, forget it. I don't know. I've always wanted to. Um, I'm struggling, so I'm going to start a show and I'm going to interview people who I think can help me. <laughs> and I'm going to be myself. And I. I had a few weeks of perfectionism where I was like trying to figure out what to call the show and what the thing and I'm like, whatever, I'm going to call it the Carrie Roldan show and I'm going to start it. And um, the minute I did that, success came to me. And it was because I finally just gave up on trying to be successful and said, I'm going to be myself and I'm going to tell people what I'm going through and I'm going to share what I'm good at and I'm going to own up to what I'm not good at. And that's when the magic happened. So did I answer your question or do you want me to share what? we had talked about before. I, we'll get to that. Okay. Um, just a couple points. I think and you make a real, real good point about Hangouts. I host Hangouts to learn. I, I mean, I love you all, but I've learned something from each of you, and that's why I host Hangouts, and that's why I choose the guests I choose. I want to learn. I want to be better, and it, it, it's not so much my business. It's so much me as a human being to to be a better person. Uh, and and so what say the rest of you? Okay, I, now you got me going here, Carrie Ann. I mean, Carrie, not Carrie, I'm thinking of another Carrie Ann, but Carrie, I think what you're saying is so true about authenticity and being yourself and being genuine. I think with Google Plus, it gives you that platform. And, you know, as John, as you mentioned, that, you know, there are, there are people who are hardcore who come onto this platform who just want to sell and they just want to talk about their business. And then when you look at their profile or their page, especially their profile, it's all about me, 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 me. You get really turned off really fast and all their, and they don't, and then if you comment back, but then they don't comment back on you, you feel kind of like it's just a kind of a one-sided relationship where you, you get kind of tired of that individual and then you just, you're not interested in, in that. And I think the idea is that you really have to, I mean, truly Google Plus is building relationships globally now and that you're connecting with people that, you know, as John mentioned with um, my challenge, people from Asia, people from Belize, people from New Zealand, Australia, you know, all these people around the world. And what it's leading to is that we're talking about common interests that we have first, which then builds on that relationship, which then builds on the fact that you may want to do business with them. Or you might have a referral like, oh, I know, you know, hey, Malone, I know a guy named Malonis and he knows about crowd, you know, crowdfunding and I think you, you know, you should definitely meet this person. Let me do a, you know, an informal introduction. Uh, I'll just, I'll ping him and I'll, I'll introduce you. I mean, that's the beauty, I think, of what Google Plus is about, is that here you have the world in your fingertips, literally in front of your, your, your desktop, laptop, I mean, laptop, desktop, 
phone, you know, you, you choose your, your mechanism. And that to me is what, again, back to that whole idea of success. You're, I mean, you're branching out. You're expanding your horizon that you can't get anywhere else. I mean, to me, that in itself is, you know, a wonderful thing. And then, the, as you said, John, about creating your, your HOA, I mean, you know, it's not, yeah, there are things that don't work, and yeah, sometimes you fail at it, but yet you learn from that. And then, again, that's building on that success-failure, you know, um, concept that we keep talking about because it kind of goes hand in hand and as Carrie as Carrie's saying is this balancing act that you're having but you're ba hopefully you're balancing but you're moving forward as you're balancing um, so that's kind of what my thoughts are with with what the, what the palace has been saying cool John um, do you mind if I weigh in just for a moment back yourself up oh excellent thank you um, so you guys authenticity is is absolutely you guys covered that I agree with everything you guys said um, now, the, the piece of transparency is what I think is interesting, and I think this revolution is happening, especially in the sales industry. Take, take like the concept of the used car salesman 50 years ago. He had all the information on the vehicle, and he can make a huge profit on every sale because he knew if, it, if there was something wrong with it, and he would just lie to your face and sell you the car for a huge profit. Now with technology, every, everyone can go to get a Carfax or whatever these other technologies are out there. So the used car salesman can't operate in the same vacuum that they did traditionally. But that also goes, I think, for all sales and all types of interaction. You have to be fully transparent. The hanging a carrot in front of somebody and then charging an arm and a leg for them to get the rest of it, I think, is going away. Because people have been sold that way for so long that they're just disgusted with salesmen who go and do that. And I personally am disgusted. I never sell that way. Because I think it just, uh, I think, I think if you can empower someone to go ahead and do something on their own, then go ahead and do it. If you if you reveal the whole process and you give them everything they need to know, there one of two things will happen. You either just empowered an individual who could do it on their own, and you save them a bunch of money, and they're going to be just your biggest evangelist ever because you taught them something. Or the number two will be, you know what, Manolis? Even if I could do this, you just told me what's really involved in the process, and I still want to use you to do it for me because I trust that because you didn't try to sell me and you gave it to me for free, I actually want you to be the guy to help me do it, or I want your product to be the product to help me do it. So, like, authenticity is number one. Transparency is number two because the consumer, it's now seller beware. It's no longer buyer beware. It's seller beware because the sellers have a lot more risk in today's te technological workplace. So just wanted to give you that little tidbit. Thank you, Manolis. We're, uh, like I said, we got about another 10 hangouts here. One thing, and I, I brought this up in the green room, and I, I, I think it's really important, and, and I want Carrie to, to share this story with us because um, – a about a month ago, gosh, it's been a month. Carrie had me as a guest on her hangout, and I uh, I, I made a remark at something I was going to say. I said I don't want to offend anybody, okay, by what I'm about to say. And Carrie, I want you to share what you told me. I said you have to offend people. You have to, um, because if you're not a little bit offensive you don't stand for anything, right? Like you you have to go ahead and speak your offensive truth. Now that's different than, than like trying to be offensive or trying to, uh, I think people can, you, you can smell the fake controversy, right? Like the Jerry Springer-ness of it. But just be yourself. If you're constantly worried about who you might offend, you're not going to connect with anyone. And I think that's something that especially when, when we start to go public, right, when we start to, whether it's starting your hangout or it's putting your business out into the world, one of the things everybody seems to struggle with is finding their authentic voice. And sorry, uh, can you guys hear my kids? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> but if you can't find your authentic, vo you can't find your authentic voice, without getting authentic and that means getting a little controversial figuring out what it is you stand for and recognizing when you do that you're gonna alienate some people but that's the whole point is go ahead and alienate those people they were never your people anyway <laughs> and 
speak your authentic truth because that's what's going to get your real people, right? Your tribe to resonate, to to raise their hand and say, "That's my authentic truth too." I want to I want to work with you. I want to buy from you. I want to be in your tribe. I want to know more about you. So that was it. Is it? You can't be afraid to be offensive. You just you got to. And I got to say this: uh, the, we we ended the hangout and we talked in the green room for a while, and we went our separate ways. And my my actual feeling inside was, damn, okay. And and I, from a very good perspective, it yeah, I, probably one of the better things I've learned since I've been here that s screw being appropriate sometimes. It, 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 I think you have to speak your heart. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, John, it's not like screw, it's, it's not, I don't think it's that. It's more about being yourself. And if you, like I post things now that interest me and that I find that I think others would be interested in. And I find that I have been posting more and more things that are coming out of me that I find interesting, and that that's where the like-minded people come from. Is that if they're interested in you, they'll they'll plus one comment or share. The ones who don't will will basically drop off, and that's kind of how I see it. Is back into um, within Google Plus, we'll take it back there. Is the whole idea of, of circles, right? that when you circle somebody you hopefully you find them of interest and in that you want to follow or you know you like what they have but then you find that they they put things or post things that you're not interested in you or might find offensive you decide I'm going to uncircle and I find that's kind of like your 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 weeding out process where you know here's your here's your people who follow you here's your audience they like what you have to say they they comment they share they they have that dialogue with you and the ones who don't they just they leave and that's okay you know it's kind of like you know meeting someone at Starbucks for the first time you spend 10 minutes with each other you find out if you like each other it, you take it a little further you know there's more hours spent on Starbucks but if you decide not to it's okay and no one's offended you shouldn't be I mean I think also too people get really offended when you uncircle or you're scared that you're uncircling somebody and I think that's kind of like a mindset that people need to kind of get over with because the fact is is that it just didn't work out and it's okay and it's not necessarily you're offending people you're just being yourself and if they can't take you for who you are then they're really not people who you want who should be interested in you and vice versa you you you're just not that into them. <laughs> yeah, and, and you or you're not into me, and that's okay. I mean, I don't take it as offense. And I I mean, to me, that's part of circling in itself. We can talk about that for hours, but it's like it, it, you can weed people out that way because then you don't have to go back and uncircle because they just self-selected. They did, they just moved on, and that's okay. Or as one of Manolis's countrymen would say, George Costanza, <laughs> it's not you, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> Why, why is George Costanza one of my countrymen? He's Greek. <laughs> is he? George Costanza? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I didn't know he played a Greek. I thought he was Jewish. Well, <laughs> he's a, Jew, a Jewish descent with a Greek last name. <laughs> ah, good call. Good call on that. Actually, to weigh in, too, on what you just said, um, Karen, about the circling, and, and I will say this, like, my best platform is Twitter. I'm just really good at Twitter. Um... But from the perspective of Google Plus, like I find that it is such a valuable platform, but it takes a lot of time in Google Plus to really gain gain a. I mean, I don't want to say gain, but to build relationships on Google Plus and to keep up with them, it actually is a ton of work. So it's almost like you have to commit to the platform. Um, in in that regard. And, and that's one area where I, I think you're right. The uncircling and the circling is, is important to kind of make sure that the message that you're receiving from people uh, is, is something that you want to continue to receive. Um, I think one thing you were going to talk about, John, and I don't know if this was going to be your next question, but you said something about strategies that people use to cope with their fears. Did you I still... Minolis, you're a mind reader. <laughs> okay, perfect. That's, that's what I was thinking you were going to head into. So... One thing that um one thing that I that I did uh, in the past and I need to do again because I've noticed that when I stopped doing it, parts of my life di didn't go as well as planned. Um, 
something called The Hour of Power, which again is by Anthony Robbins. It's called The Hour of Power. And what I, what I really like about this practice is you, you take an hour and you divide it into four segments. Your first 15 minutes, uh, either you, you could be moving and doing this or you could you know, split it up in different segments, but you either can be moving and thinking about the things you're grateful for or what I like to do is I like to write them down. So for the first 15 minutes, it's gratitude. For the next 15 minutes, it's how do I want my future to be? And you write yourself as if you've already achieved or, or you've become the things you want to become. The third 15 minutes is how do I want my day to go today if it was in the best case scenario? So if I had a tough conversation I had to have with a client, what would be the best case scenario and outcome of that? Almost like future casting what that would look like. And then the last 15 is affirmations, which would be um, if you have some sort of insecurity, you would affirm to yourself the opposite of that insecurity. You would say uh, an affirmation that would kind of affirm the fact that that insecurity is not real. It's something that has happened throughout my life that I feel is the truth, but it's really not the truth. And I need to affirm it out of my system so that I don't have that as a limitation. So when I first started my business, I did this hour of power from October 2013 to March 2014, and then in April we actually got our first clients. So I did it for six months straight, didn't have a way to make any revenue, and then, then we started making money after I did that. Um, when I stopped though, plus I also dropped, I was also down to 220 pounds. When I stopped, now I'm like back up to 300 pounds because I've been working so much. So like things, things got out of balance because I wasn't taking care of myself. I was taking care of everybody else but myself. So that's why the balance piece is, is the tough part, but you just reminded me that I have to start doing my hour of power again. <laughs> okay, and, and I appreciate you sharing that. What I'd like to do is we're getting real close to wrapping up here, and what I'd kind of like to do is ask the rest of you to talk about what do you do to stay in balance? I'll go. So um, I actually wrote a book about it because it works so much in my life. But like Manolis, it's funny. Even when you're the person who wrote the book on it, <laughs> sometimes you still forget to do it. Um, and the exact same thing happened for me. I recognize I'm out of balance. What am I not doing? And for me, it's running. So um, I wrote a book called Run Yourself Happy. It's a five-week training program to release anxiety and create space for miracles. And for me, the anxiety component is dealing with my fear. And I have all these practices that I do, and I do them while running. And there's great reasons for it, but ultimately, when I don't get my run in, and I don't remember to take my spiritual practice on my run, to take my hour of power on my run, um, I get out of balance. And so for me, that's what it is. It's, it's physical activity and spiritual practice combined that make the difference. John's muted, but I think he's saying... Yeah, the room. Thank you, Karen. All right, we'll go to Karen and come back to Catherine. So I guess I, for my balance, it's a good question, John. I mean, there's just so many different activities that I'm doing outside. I mean, one of the things I've learned, I, I've worked in corporate America for like over 20 years. I... Um, got laid off in 2011 and kind of my world kind of changed in a sense that I you know wasn't working in corporate America anymore and I was able to explore and get into my creativity and I think that's kind of where my balance comes from now is that I try to have you know a work balance lifestyle where I'm doing things that can feed off my creativity which then kind of goes back to my work in terms of what I've learned from that and I mean there's just so many different things that I've worked on um, in the past uh, nine years um, just from the recession and just all that stuff that was going on because I worked in the financial services industry and all the stress that comes through that as a, as a marketer um, 
that I've learned to basically kind of take one step at a time, one day at a time, and actually spend a lot of time actually with different types of people because I kind of feed off on that energy, learning from, um, you know, different age groups. So I, I spend a lot of time with seniors and I spend a lot of time with children, not my personal children, but just in general. And you kind of see how, how they see life in, in their perspective in the sense that in of both ages, they have no fear. You know, they just go out and do things, and because when you're older, you don't you don't care anymore. You just do whatever you want to do. And as a child, you don't you're not told to basically say, oh, you can't do that. They just go out and explore. And so I think that's kind of where my balance is now being is just kind of getting back into my I guess inner child older person mode, <laughs> and and kind of like finding that comfort level. Catherine. Yeah, I, I'm actually kind of with Manolis. I, I'm never really in balance. You know, the I, I read somewhere that a trip to the moon actually is 97% of the time off course, and it's about correct, you know, course corrections rather than um, being in balance necessarily. Um, so for me, I think I, I think of it more in terms of again going back to uh, keeping it close to being aligned with the inner self rather than trying to balance all the different moving parts in our lives because when when we are tuned into our inner core and into our uh, our higher self in that way then all of the all the moving pieces kind of seem to fit in better by themselves without us trying to manipulate them into balance somehow I don't yeah Okay. And, and John, um, may I just chime in one last time? Sure. Knock yourself out. Sorry about that, John. Um, That's all right. That's one of what the you're here for. <laughs> exactly. One other thing, Catherine, um, that I would, I would agree with you there is, um, and it goes back to an earlier comment, as a business owner, you have to become out of balance to the point where, you've, where you essentially cannot take it anymore. And that usually means you've either gotten a lot more clients, and so you, you can't handle the work that's coming in, and you're you're charging a fair rate for whatever your service or product is. So you, you get to that point where you can't where you can't handle it anymore alone, and then you bring balance in by doing one of two things: you hire an employee, or you find a way to outsource, or whatever the case may be. Because if you can get it to the point where it can sustain itself through systems. That's the struggle is from becoming the solopreneur with no system to the entrepreneur who now has some systems because they can afford it. They've learned the ropes of their business. They know what needs to be automated and what needs to be personal. And suddenly now they can either outsource the automated stuff that they shouldn't be doing anymore or they can hire a new employee to handle sales or whatever the case may be. So I think balance in the early stages is definitely not achievable. But I'm going through my own growth process to determine how do I gain balance with automation and outsourcing. So, you know, that's that's all I want to say. Okay, thank you. Manolis, I'm going to stay with you. We're going to get ready to wrap up here in a few minutes. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've got coming up in the next couple weeks or months? Sure. So what, what we've decided to do as a result of our year in 2014 we, we really were consulting projects going through the crowdfunding process. We helped about 10 campaigns raise 825000 uh, over the course of the year. Uh, fully transparent, we also helped about an equal number that didn't reach their goal. So I'm not 100%, and crowdfunding is never 100%. So I want to just put that out there that it's a risky business. Um, what we saw, though, was only 90% of the people, only 10% of the people that came to us we could help hands-on because of either they could afford our services or we felt that they were of a mindset that they could pull it off with our help. The other 90% we historically were kind of just saying, just go to our YouTube channel and take a look at our free video resources. Well, going with the whole tribe concept that Carrie said, we've created a crowdfunding tribe. I created a social network, which is a subdomain on my realitycrowdtv.com website. It's a virtual incubator and crowdfunding network. It's not a crowdfunding platform where you raise money through it. It's a community of mentors who are trying to help people learn how to crowdfund, and people can ask questions.
People are answering them for free. It's just a nice community we're trying to build around the brand of crowdfunding in general. And so that's the immediate thing that we're up to is building that out. Uh, in a month, we have 400 registered members, so it's growing pretty good. Um, then uh, from November 30th to December 18th of, of this year, we're hosting the first annual virtual crowdfunding summit, a three-week completely online event using Google Hangouts on Air. And in fact, I may, need to, I may need some of your help on this who know how to run Hangouts. It'll be 150 panels over a three-week period with the Holy potential for 600 cow. speakers. So this is going to be one of the most massive things I've ever tried to undertake uh, ever. Uh, so it's going to be a big thing. Uh, in, in one month, we already have about 80 speakers signed up for it, so it's definitely going to happen. Um, so that's kind of what I'm doing, and that's why I've gained 80 pounds over the last year. <laughs> well, thank you, Manuel. Listen, now the rest of us will crawl back into our insecurity. No. Um, Karen, what do you got going on? Uh, I don't think I can. I can out top that, uh, Malonis. You got like a whole project. You got a team of people working on that with you, or you just you? Uh, it's it's myself and my CEO Jessica's son, but um, I've been talking to Dennis Deuce, who's really good at HOAs, yeah. and a few other people. But I I could use. I would love to get the whole G Plus community involved as moderators. I would love for anyone who'd like to be involved, who knows how to run them, uh, to all of us to work together. Cool. Yeah, the community. Yeah, I think, I mean, so what you just described is, it sounds like a really awesome project. I mean, just massive in scale. And it's, and it's basically, she said, just a one-month period, you're saying? How long is this thing going to last in terms of your... your yeah, just, it'll, it'll be three, um, three weeks from November 30th to December 18th. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so, John, I think you think you know a little bit about me. I'm actually right now in the midst of... Um, having a, a challenge out here in the Google Plus community called 28 Days of Love um, Challenge. And the idea was my my gift back to the Google Plus community for the, the fact that I learned so much from it in terms of building engagement and um, taking that knowledge and sharing that with the idea of helping others in terms of meeting other people. Um, not in a relationship dating sense, um, but more in terms of, of a business sense of just trying to get people to um, write from from what they love and to build content and original content, not, necess not necessarily curate content as many of us have done, but actually create things from our own heart and talk about them. And the idea has kind of mushroomed, I think, now into a, a pretty active community, as you would say, John where people are involved and they're talking of course about their daily loves but it's expanding more into other aspects and other avenues of discussion that um, is I, I think some of it is actually it is going to lead to business in some form um, because there have been actually some um, ideas and things that have been percolated because of the creativity that has kind of spawned from the challenge so that pretty much is happening for me for the month of February and then from that point on I think there's a, at least another couple more other challenges I see throughout the year that I want to create um, for the community to, to, to again um, it's kind of um, have folks um, understand kind of what the experience I've gone through being here on Google Plus. Thanks, Karen. Catherine? Mute. Okay. Um, wow. I, you guys are <laughs> simultaneously intimidating and inspiring. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's the fear of success versus the failure, you know, thing, right, going on. Holy cow. Uh, I, I guess for me, most of what's going on from a, a business standpoint, most of what I'm doing right now is building relationships with, you know, radio and podcast hosts and kind of, you know, um, laying that foundation work uh, for future. A lot of what I'm doing right now is kind of honing in on, on the branding, personal branding, business branding stuff, that process. That's That's taken a while and I'm kind of just now beginning to really get that and kind of locked in um, on that um, that scale and uh, and tackling my fears of being seen which yeah, that's 
<laughs> it's going to take a while to. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're beautiful, so don't be afraid to be sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Manolo. <laughs> <laughs> going to take that one. <laughs> Hey, hey. We are the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Carrie's Carrie's polite when she says she's a perfectionist. I'm anal retentive. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, do you want to share with us what you've got coming up in the next couple weeks? Yeah. Well, in the next couple weeks, um, I'm actually so it turns out right in following the call of my soul. What I'm really great at, what I really love doing, is um, promoting other people, helping other people get their incredible work out in the world. And I didn't know that when I started my show that that's what I was doing, but I freaking love it. And um, I mean, I do business consulting, and I, I'm um, I'm kind of a like I call myself the business BFF, right? But I'm really like your word whisperer. I really I'm so awesome at articulating what it is that you've been trying to say for years. Um, having said that, what's coming up in the next few weeks for me is just more about living in alignment with the call of my soul. And funnily, and funnily, oddly enough, when I started doing that, the phone started ringing, which was great. And people have been asking me to um, help them launch their product, specifically be a co-host on their webinar, help them feel comfortable help them, maybe they're like kind of boring in real life or they're afraid of the camera or whatever it is, right? Um, and just just help them, put them at ease and help them through that process. And I'm flipping loving it. So um, I'm doing quite a bit of that coming up. Good. Well, I want to thank you guys. Uh, I've got notes for another 10 Hangouts. We have to do this again sometime. This, this was not only a lot of fun, but I think we just kind of scratched the surface. So um, I want to thank you all for being there, those of you in the audience. Thanks so much. And uh, I'm going to stop the broadcast now, and I hope you all have a great day. Bye-bye now. <laughs>